So today, Bill Hamilton from Louisiana State University has been kind enough just to come out to teach the class. Uh, Bill did his PhD at Stanford uh, uh, with Bill Fairbank. Many moons ago. Many moons ago. About the same time as I was at Princeton with John Wiener. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then went to LSU and Fairbank and Hamilton together initiated the first work on cryogenically cooled uh, uh, gravitational wave detectors, resonant mass for bar gravitational wave detectors. And uh, Bill has been at the forefront then of uh, the technology and then the gravitational wave searches with resonant mass detectors ever since then. So he's going to give us an overview of resonant mass detectors. Okay, thank you, Kip. And um, I asked Kip before we started if uh, he would mind if I encouraged you all to ask questions as we go along. And uh, he said he wouldn't mind at all. In fact, I might have trouble shutting you all up. And so that's fine. I also uh, uh, said... Uh, that I'm afraid that some of what you're going to hear, you're going to interpret as electrical engineering rather than as, uh, as physics. And, but uh, uh, let me assure you that what we are talking about is what physics used to be before the age of the computer. Uh, everybody now thinks they can do uh, work with uh, everything they can do by simulation. And uh, um, you can't. You, uh, uh, we need people in physics who build things. I, I have referred to myself as sort of uh, in jest, but not totally, as a simple plumber. Some of we we do make things, and if there's anything that you that I would hope that you'd carry away from these talks is uh, the. Uh, uh, the idea that we still do need people in physics who are willing to get in, get their hands dirty, and uh, and make things and and make mistakes when you make things. Now I'm going to I'm going to show you some things that are wrong in the course of this lecture. Some uh, uh, some mistakes that we made, um, and uh, the uh, uh, the hope from this is that you'll uh, carry off with this the idea that there's no dishonor in making mistakes. We've all, we, we've all done it, we just don't write about it. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there is even a paper published, but I forgot to put it on here, where in the journal Cryogenics, where we listed all the mistakes we made in making the apparatus I'm going to show you. Uh, and uh, uh, but. So I so said I had forgotten uh, when I started. Now the other thing that I'd like you to carry off from this is that in anything that's gone on for a long time, there are an awful lot of people that have contributed. And uh, so uh, uh, I've uh, now I've left off of this list the people that uh, have really made this field go. Bill Fairbank that we started with, Joe Weber, who started all of this business with resonant bars. And in fact, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I gave a talk in uh, Perth, Australia, uh, at the uh, Amaldi meeting. I was asked to speak uh, about Joe Weber. And uh, you've probably heard stories, some of you, about um, the, uh, the work that Weber did and, and uh, some people commenting on the mistakes Weber made. But it's a very, uh, uh, I had asked his wife to uh, uh, send me some information, which she did and, and which I incorporated in the, uh, uh, in the talk I gave about Weber. One of, one of them, as a matter of fact, was a picture taken of the, uh, USS Lexington sinking in the Battle of the Coral Sea. And uh, I, uh, Weber was a junior officer on board the Lexington, and I uh, used that as an uh, example of 
the kinds of things people do before they get involved in physics. Or, uh, and, but uh, she made, uh, I, I saw her uh, again a week ago in Albuquerque, thanked her for what she had sent me, and she made a very, very uh, touching remark, I think. She said, well, you know, people have already forgotten all about him. She said there was an article published in, uh, and you may have seen the article in Scientific American, this last one that just came out. And she said there was no mention of him at all. Uh, and yet, the, uh, those of us that have been in the, uh, in the field for a while, and, and, and this is to be expected, but uh, on the other hand, it's also too bad. You, uh, uh, you labor away, these guys have, have, have labored away, um, and uh, people in, uh, um, in physics have uh, forgotten about uh, what a lot of them did. Bruce Pipes, for instance, now is the uh, provost at Franklin and Marshall. Uh, Tom Bernat, running a big program at uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore in the Fusion Project. David Blair, some of you may have heard of, you may have read his book. Um, in uh, at Western in the University of Western Australia, Yarda Cadlet, a, a, uh, a consultant now in uh, in Munich, used to be in, with digital equipment, uh, and so forth. I mean, most of these guys were people that came in as uh, as postdocs or assistant professors, um, and people do go on and do other things. Bu Xin Xu, uh, for example, is uh, now the man in charge of all of, uh, of General Electric's magnetic resonance imaging uh, for a, uh, uh, doing all the design work on it and uh, uh, helping GE get greater than a 50% share worldwide. Uh, Norbert Solomonson spent some time here at uh, Caltech with LIGO. Steve Merkowitz is uh, working on the LISA project now, um, in charge of the thrusters on LISA. Andrew Morris, interesting case, did a, uh, started out, thought he wanted to be an experimentalist, decided that experimental things weren't his thing and did some data analysis and now is, uh, was telling me that he's working for uh, companies that uh, look for credit card fraud. You know, you'd, you would like when you, you when you lose your credit card, you would like for them to uh, find right away if the spending pattern is not correct. Well, Andrew did his uh, did his thesis work on uh, uh, Bayesian analysis. How do you use a Bayesian analysis to try to see in noisy data whether you've got gravity waves? Uh, and uh, he tells me that what they're now doing is uh, they've uh, have a system of a uh, neural network system for looking for what what goes on in with credit cards and what spending patterns are. Can they find fraud? And he said by uh, encompassing uh, um, uh, by uh, whoops, yeah, there we go. By encompassing. Uh, um, Neural network by encompassing in the neural networks Bayesian analysis, why it's increased the accuracy of how well they can find fraud and cut down the time by 50%. So, you go into gravity wave research, you go and uh, who knows where you may end up, and you may not even be remembered for what you did, as, uh, uh, or people, people may, uh, may forget what you did. But all of these people, uh, have contributed to what we're going to see. The picture is gone. The, uh, it went to sleep and uh, uh, came back and the picture is gone. So there's, 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 there's something weird probably with PowerPoint. But fortunately, yes, 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 yeah. Fortunately, I brought in two pictures. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is Peter Salson from uh, uh, who you, has Peter talked to you? I know. Um, uh, at uh, looking at the uh, Allegro experiment, ah, oh, thanks. Uh, looking at the Allegro experiment before we had to move it, um, 
Now, what I'm going to try, so this is, this picture is to give you an idea of what is involved. I'll be showing you the pieces of it. Now, in a little bit, I'll be showing you the pieces, but I want you to come back and sort of remember this picture, and if, uh, if worse comes to worse, you don't remember where things went, why, uh, we can go back and look at it again. This gives you an idea of the scale of things. This is, uh, is an aluminum bar. Um, 10 feet long. There's a reason for the 10 feet. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, two feet in diameter. Um, the, uh, this is a tank that holds uh, uh, liquid helium. All of this is an experiment that is designed to run at uh, 4 degrees Kelvin and was originally intended to run at uh, a few milli-degrees Kelvin when we first designed it back in 1968, when dinosaurs walked the face of the Earth. This is the, uh, this is the transducer that converts vibrations of this, uh, uh, of this bar into electrical signals. These guys hanging down here are what are called Tabor isolators to isolate vibrations coming along the wires uh, from exciting the bar. I hope that it will become clear to you as we go along why we need these. Um, and all of this is really a great big thermos bottle. You're just looking on its, on its side. This particular shell is cooled to liquid helium temperatures. Then there is a vacuum space. Clearly, you can't uh, see much of that, but this is all of this will be vacuum. There is a, an end cap goes on here so that all of this is maintained in its own separate vacuum. Uh, then there is uh, then there is an insulating vacuum out here, and all of this is just sheets of mylar coated with aluminum. You can look at them as mirrors. If everything in here is maintained at four degrees above uh, the absolute zero temperature of liquid helium, now I'm being approximate in the numbers I give you. It's 4.217, depending on what the atmospheric pressure is and all of that, but let, let's just say four degrees. Uh, so this is maintained at four degrees. The burn off gas from this, there you can see pipes running around. So I say I'm a simple plumber. The pipes take the blow off gas from the liquid helium and use that to cool this shell here. That is so that it'll intercept, uh, so that the cold gas then will help intercept any heat that's coming in. Then you have some of this aluminized mylar. You don't see it very well on this shell, but they're just acting as mirrors to uh, reflect back any heat that might be coming in from outside. Question? As something important, it vibrates a lot. How do you do Ah, you'll see. You'll see. We'll come there. The, the question, if you didn't hear it on the... Uh, uh, it, it, comes it comes through. Okay. Uh, the question is, how do you avoid vibration? And we'll, and, and, and we'll come to that. That's, that's why this is in a separate system all by itself. In fact, maybe, uh, well, let's, let's see. Then, then there's a shell for liquid nitrogen. And finally, this outside shell which holds out all the outside world so that when we cool it down, we don't freeze the whole world. Now, your question. How do you keep, it from vibra how do you keep the vibration from the boiling from affecting you? And uh, um, uh, in the course of years, this is, uh, this is how we figured out how to do it. Let me explain what some of these are, and let me, uh, let me also point out some of the numbers up here. Uh, this is the approximate degree of vibration isolation that we have from one stage to the next stage to the next stage. That is, if you are to shake the ground out here, if you're to shake the ground out here, how much how much does the is, is the vibration decreased by each each stage? So what you were looking at, you were looking at the big thermos bottle before. Let me go back to that briefly. Here is the big thermos bottle. 
you can see right up here on top, you can see a table. This table is supported just right at the corner, there's an air pad. Uh, uh, basically, we started out with uh, inner tubes. And then we found that industry made these things, that Goodyear makes them, makes a big inner tube that uh, is made to be a machine, uh, a machine isol vibration isolation system for big machines. And so we have those at each corner. Let me go back then. And that you see here. So here's the ground. Might be shaking. Any shaking you put that goes through this, this is the table up on top. Okay? And you get approximately 60 dB of isolation going through that air pad. Okay. You're in line with what a dB is? A dB. Okay, dB is decibel, okay, it's the ratio of uh, two powers. The amount of power that you put in as you shake something down here compared to the amount of power that, uh, that gets through, defined in this way, 10 times the log of the base 10 of the ratio of the two powers, or 20, since power goes as amplitude squared, 20 times the ratio of the two amplitudes. So if you were to shake this up and down a, uh, uh, an inch, a centimeter, okay, shake this up and down a centimeter, nominally at one kilohertz, 900 hertz, which is the frequency of the bar, at 900 hertz, you would be down by the ratio 20 times the log of the uh, the. So you're, you're down by a factor of a thousand. Yeah, down by a factor of a thousand. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, for how much how much it gets through up here. Okay. Now most of these things we we can't measure all of this. Because the uh, uh, because the uh, uh, for the for the kind of, of amplitudes that you would create in the uh, in the lab, why you can't measure through the whole chain, and so when I put these down, why for this says greater than 70 dB, it meant that at 70 dB, why we couldn't uh, we couldn't measure anything coming through, and we didn't have anything sensitive enough to measure it any further. So on top of that table then, here you'll see some cans up here on top. Okay, inside those cans, there are stacks of steel and rubber, vibration isolation. Those stacks are in cans because they share the common vacuum with, you can imagine, a shell around here, and there's a vacuum surrounding the bar. And uh, so they're in the same vacuum as the bar, all right? And then the shell that encloses things here, that's the thing that's cooled to liquid helium. Go ahead, just, uh, just ask. Isn't it hard to keep rubber in the bathroom? No. Because I, I expect it to, to have some, yeah, some dust coming out. Oh, yes, it does. It does, but keep, now, in LIGO, you can't use rubber. In LIGO, you can't use rubber because your vacuum has to be extremely good. Our vacuum needs to be good, but not nearly so good. And we have something else going for us. Surrounding this, that you can't see on this picture, surrounding this, we have a shell. That's cooled to four degrees absolute. And so anything that comes off out of the rubber, now it isn't just plain ordinary rubber, it's silicone rubber, it's expensive as the Dickens, but uh, uh, coming, uh, anything that comes out of that rubber is gonna get eaten up and freeze on one of the wells before it gets down there to bother anything. So basically the only thing that, that uh, we have a good vacuum, but it's not a really perfect vacuum, deliberately so. We found out that we, this is again through experiment, we had to discover all of this. Um, you have enough heat coming down, you're, you're 300 degrees Kelvin out here, 290 or 
well, in, in Louisiana, maybe 310. And uh, so you've, 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 got, you've got a high temperature out here. You've got a low temperature in here. So you've got, you've got, uh, you've got conduction down these uh, titanium rods. And uh, when you, uh, and so if we had an absolutely perfect vacuum, why this would gradually warm up to somewhere above four degrees. We don't want it to do that. So we keep a small amount of helium gas in there, and we're, but we're sure that it's pure helium gas because it's the only thing that can live there in that vacuum. Okay. Now, you all know about the amount of vibration isolation you need because you know how small gravity waves are. And uh, now we did not appreciate when we started this experiment. <laughs> it's just like home. It's, uh, um, we're we're working in a uh, in a in a building that is being constructed, and uh, so uh, is this. This happened for all of your lectures, or uh... <sighs> okay. Um, the uh, um, so we have uh, uh, people do not appreciate just how much vibration isolation you need. It is interesting. I commented to Kip. It is interesting to see history repeat itself as LIGO gets built, and. Uh, uh, and we have all sorts of theoretical estimates of how good the vibration isolation was, how good it needed to be, and we see that it isn't enough. If there's anything that explains why Allegro, that's, that's our experiment at, at LSU, is as successful it, as it has been, it's that we've done a really good job on vibration isolation. Now, again, that doesn't sound like physics. It, uh, you know, engineering or whatever, but it, uh, uh, but it's it's what we uh, what we needed in order to make it work. Let me say one uh, one last thing. Another thing that we have going for us that LIGO doesn't have. Two things. One, we need to only be isolated at 900 hertz, the frequency where the bar is resonant. Okay, that is a lot easier, an awful lot easier than being isolated from 40 hertz to a kilohertz. So we have, a, we have a much easier problem. Secondly, we're only looking at the longitudinal mode of this bar. So this is, if, if we imagine the stick as being the bar, then we're going to look at gravity waves coming in and stretching the bar, making it get longer and shorter. The fundamental longitudinal mode of the of this bar is 912 hertz. And uh, so we, uh, we need to, uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, we need to isolate ourselves in a way that we are not sensitive at uh, 912 hertz where, this, where the bar is changing its length. So, we have the bar supported. You see this ti these titanium rods here in this number greater than 75 dB. What this bar is, and let me go, let me go back a, a uh, you, can, you can't quite see it here, but around the middle of the bar, the bar is hung on another titanium rod and balanced on it, like this. So that if any vibration does get in, so it's a, sort of on a pendulum, if you will, and you've already talked about vibration isolation for, uh, uh, for things like LIGO, uh, we're, we're hung on a, uh, uh, on a pendulum that should help us, and so that then any vibration that comes in, comes in up and down, like this, it's balanced at the middle. What does that do? That might cause the bar to bend a little bit, but that's a different mode. That's not the fundamental longitudinal mode. So uh, we get a we have some geometric factors also helping us on the vibration isolation. That's how we're able to get up to numbers like this. All right, there's my blank picture. There was, oops. Okay, here we go. Now. 
This is a picture that I stole from Ho Jung. I, actually, I stole it from Eugene Kocha, who uh, uh, stole it from Ho Jung Pak. Uh, how, does bar, how, how does a bar detector work? What is the principle involved? How do you measure very, very small displacements? The idea is this. This is the bar. The bar can be modeled. Now, I assume in this class you've talked about modeling also. Or, uh, and uh, uh, we can, and, and I will be showing you models from this point on. I'm going to be showing you models of, of, uh, of how we think of the bar. The bar can be modeled as a mass on a spring. The effective mass, this is a little misleading the way it's hung, but, but the, uh, the effective mass of the bar is, uh, um, is uh, half, half of its real mass, approximately. Hung on the end of the bar, and resonant it so, so you can so you can look at the at the bar as a mass between two springs, resonant or two masses between a spring uh, with one spring between them, resonant at 912 hertz. Okay. Hung on the end of the bar is another mass, a smaller one, resonant at the same frequency. Okay. Now we've all done an experiment in freshman physics probably even in high school, where you have two coupled oscillators and you see energy going back and forth between the two oscillators. In, in an approximation to conserve energy, let, let uh, uh, one half m x dot squared, the kinetic energy of this guy, if the energy were to transfer totally into this other mass, then that would be one half little m times x dot squared, and you can change x dot, replace x dot by uh, uh, omega squared times a spring constant. It all cancels out. The result is that you get that the deflection with respect to the big mass of the little mass it goes as the square root of the ratio of the masses. This is only approximate, but for government work it's fine. And uh, times the uh, uh, times the displacement of the big mass. Okay, so look what you got. This is order of magnitude a thousand kilograms. This is order of magnitude a few hundred grams. Okay, so you've got an effective multiplication, if you will, of energy being shared across this. An effective multiplication of uh, the square root of the ratio of the two masses. Okay, So this tells you that uh, you're, you're stuck with this. Actually, it will, it will turn out as we go along. You'd like this to be as big as possible. You want this to be pretty small, but you, you can't make it too small. You can't make it smaller than a few grams at best. And, uh, uh, and so you've got to end up with a way to try to detect the deflection of this. You can see that it's bigger. It is not an amplifier. Let me stress that. This is not an amplifier. What it is is a transformer. It's a mechanical transformer. There's no, there's no power gain in any of this. It's strictly a way of changing the effective impedance of this mass spring system, the bar, to, a, uh, to an impedance that more easily matches something that you would like uh, in, a, uh, uh, in an electrical system. And, when, and, and now I need to talk about that a little bit. Here's the model, extended a little bit, now, now drawn just as a mass. This is the bar, mounted on a spring spring constant k, okay? In the real world, as opposed to the cartoon that I had before, in the real world there are losses. I've uh, drawn these losses as a shock absorber, a dash pot, if you will. If you were, were an engineer, that's what you'd call it. If you've driven an automobile, it's a shock absorber. Incidentally, let me uh, let me diverge on this a little bit to say well, we were talking about what we needed in experimental physics. 
I used to always say that I didn't want anyone in the lab working on an experiment who didn't work on his own car. That's another thing, other than the computer, that has led to our downfall. Now cars are so complicated with the internal computers that no one can work on them. So I've had to find a new criterion, which I have not yet found, for, uh, for people to work in the lab. But if you enjoy doing that kind of thing, then you should think again of a career in experimental physics. So we have a mass and a spin. We have losses in a dash pot. And we've actually paid homage to Braginsky by using his symbol H for the, uh, ordinarily you'd use R for a, uh, for a resistance, those of you that have taken electrical engineering courses. And then we have the gravitational wave force, which I'm sure you all know about, the appropriate G's, C's, and the, uh, and the appropriate uh, uh, element of the gravitational tensor, or what we're going to talk about, and I'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow, is the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, what we call H, the, uh, uh, the deviation from the flat space curvature. Uh, and then hung on the end of the bar, mounted on the end, we have the small mass. Again, with some losses. And it's this that we're going to have to mop, that, that we're going to have to write down equations for when we try to figure out how well it, how it's going to work. My variables defined here. Now I want to want to go to this guy. I want to look here he is. And now hung on him and connected to the bar as you saw it from before. So everything is connected to the bar here. Okay, Just this mass is free to move with respect to the bar. Everything else is mechanically attached to it. Okay, So here this is vibrating back and forth with respect to the bar. And what we have here is an inductor. And now I need to tell you about how the, tra how the, uh, uh, how the transducer works. And I need to say a word or two about transducers. Um, the, the idea behind making something that will convert one kind of energy to another, one kind of transducer, if you will, a general way that you can look at a transducer is a transducer is something where you have arranged to store, by some means, I'll talk about that in a minute, a large amount of energy. And you let the system that you're trying to measure, you make it do something to that energy. I'm being very vague on this, but you'll, but, but, but you'll, you make it do something to that energy. And the change that it makes in that energy then is something that you, uh, uh, that you attempt to measure. Now let me, uh, let me go on. And uh, in fact, uh, let me, let me give you an example of that and something that I need to draw on the board for. All right, I, uh, because I need to talk, uh, I need to talk about uh, two kinds of things. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, going to show you the general principle that you will get. Is this board okay? Or that's fine. Yeah. Are we running out of? Oh, okay. Okay. Let's imagine I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm I'm going to give you a uh, going to give you something that you 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 may have seen. Believe it or not, you everybody has done this has 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 used this kind of amplifier that I'm going to show you amplifier transducer. You may not recognize it. And I'll add, I'll ask you in a minute. Suppose I have a signal coming in like this. I'm drawing a I'm drawing a a, a uh, a transformer here. Connected to that transformer, I'll leave resistances out for a minute. I have a tuned circuit. So I have, uh, uh, I have a generator putting in a signal. And it's, it's putting in a signal at a frequency, omega. You don't care what it is. It's resonant at the same frequency as, as this guy. Okay. Now, what's going to happen when you do that? 
what's going to happen? When I put a signal in, I put a tuned circuit like that, suppose I measure the voltage across this. I put an oscilloscope here. And I'm measuring the voltage. What am I going to see on that oscilloscope? This is a sine wave here. What's going to happen? What's going to happen on the tune circuit? What are you going to see? What are you going to see when you look at an oscilloscope? Everybody here has looked at oscilloscopes, right? What are you going to see when you look at it? So you'll see your sine wave. You'll You'll see a sine wave, you'll see it grow, we'll put in a little bit of resistance, so it grows up to some level. So you look in and I see a sine wave, okay? So here's the sine wave that I'm seeing. Okay? Now, imagine that I can do the following. Imagine that I can magically reach in to this capacitor with my hands, and suppose I can pull the capacitor plates apart, or I can push the capacitor plates together. OK? Everybody with me? All right. Let me suppose that at the point that I see on the oscilloscope, the voltage right up at the maximum, let me take the capacitor plates and let me pull them apart. OK? Now, question for everybody else, not Kip. Kip knows the answer to this, OK? Question, what happens to the capacitance when you pull the capacitor plates apart? It goes up or down? I hear it I hear goes down, question mark, or goes, goes down definitely? How many say down? How many say up? Come on. What happens? Sure. Sure. The capacitance goes down. You've all had to teach freshman physics in the years past. The capacitance goes down when you pull it apart. OK? Now, what's the relationship between capacitance, charge, and voltage? Freshman physics, again. When you're teaching the second semester of e &M in the freshman lab, relationship between capacitance, charge, and voltage. Anyone remember? I'm not being fair to you, I guess. You got most of grad students and folks <laughs> Well, so there, 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 there's, there, though, these are the things that, OK. OK, Q, the amount of charge on a capacitor equals the uh, uh, capacitance times the voltage. Now, look at what happened. Look at, look at what's hap what happens. I get up to this point here. I magically reach in. I pull my capacitor plates apart. OK, have I changed the charge on the capacitance at all when I do that? Therefore. Therefore, what happens to the voltage when I pull them apart? Charge remains the same. The capacitance has decreased. The voltage must go up. OK. Now I wait. I've, I've exaggerated this picture. I wait. The charge now goes over, goes through the inductor. OK, and then, so the energy is stored now. I had a bunch of energy in, on the capacitor. Anyone remember what the energy of a, of a charged capacitor is? Right, 1 half CV squared, or Q squared over 2C, OK, when it, was, when it was charged. OK, the energy is now going over and going in the inductor. What's the energy of an inductor when it's, anyone remember? You may be doing relativity, but damn it, <laughs> you are supposed to know about inductances, capacitances, and the, okay? Anyone remember? One well, half R I squared, exactly so. Okay. Now, yeah, so the energy is all over here. Okay, when the current is here, and there's no charge on the capacitor. Okay. So here it goes. 
here by measuring the voltage across the capacitor. Here it goes back down here. When it gets here and there's no voltage on it, I put the capacitor plates back together again. Okay? There's no charge on it. Nothing happens. Okay? But here we come. Now here comes the energy back out of the inductor. Comes back down. And now what do you suppose I do when I get here? Pull it apart again. Voltage goes up. Charge is the other way around because it's, uh, it's on the other plate now. Pull it apart. Goes up again. Goes on over here. And so forth. I can continue pulling this. Now notice, how many times did I pull it during, the, uh, during one cycle? Twice. So, if this is something that is resonant at a frequency f, and this, this is a transducer of some kind, incidentally, let me point out. This is resonant at some frequency f. I've got this energy stored in it from this guy that's driving it. If it's resonant at a frequency f, I am pumping it, pulling it apart, to f, twice the frequency. Okay? And I'm pumping the voltage up more and more. Now, I'm doing work also. I'm putting energy into it because when there is charge on the capacitor plate, there is a force between the capacitor plate. The bottom plate and the top plate are attracted to each other, so I'm doing work. When there's no charge on it, I put it back together. I'm not taking any energy out, so I'm home free. And then I pull it apart again. Now, what, what I have what I have demonstrated to you is something that was used in the early days of the space program. It's called a degenerate parametric amplifier. Something, and, and the capacitors that you used in, on these were diodes. And uh, there are all sorts of things. I looked in the Fairchild Library last night, and you can find a couple of books in there on the design of parametric amplifiers. And uh, um, now, I said you'd all used one of these. Anyone know what you've done? Anyone know what I might be considering as, a, uh, as an example that every one of you had, had used? Notice what I have in this. I have something which is being conserved. I have the charge, which is changing due to my pumping, but something that basically while I do the action on it is being conserved. Okay? Something has done work. My hands have reached in and pulled the capacitor plates apart. So something has done work. And, it's, and I put more energy into the system by this, okay? Ever thought about how, when you were a kid, maybe even some of you, if you're in your second childhood as I am, why uh, then, then you go and, and do. Look at how you, how does, how does a little kid pump up a swing? When you are sitting on a swing in the play yard, what do you do? You get yourself started swinging, okay? What is conserved? Angular momentum, because there's no torques. You're not, you're not doing anything to the outside world. There's no torques, okay? What do you do? When you're swinging, you pull on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, supports to the swing. What does that do? Well, the angular momentum, L, is equal to I times omega, okay? L is conserved. When you pull on the ropes, what do you do? What do you do to I, the moment of inertia? You decrease it. So when you pull on it, you have decreased L, or you've, you've decreased I, L is conserved, omega goes up. What do you do when you get out way out at the end, you let go of the, of the uh, ropes, fine, you go, you go back out, nothing happens, but you have put energy in, you have pulled against the centripetal force, if you will, as you, uh, as, as you were pulling it up, and you've, you've put work in there, and now then you come back, now no one ever pumps the swing twice, little kids, you, use, you usually only pump when you're going forward. But believe, believe me, if with a little bit of coordination, uh, you can try pumping as you go back down, and you'll go up twice as fast. If you stand on a swing, most kids who stand on a swing, 
stand on the string will do it twice. Right, right, right. Yeah, good point. Good point. Okay, so we have a transducer. We are putting energy into the system. We have an apple up here. Let's see what happens. All right. Now, what's the transducer we use? On the uh, on the gravity wave experiment, we're doing everything cold because it is cold. We said, well, let's uh, uh, let's make take all the advantage that we can of the fact that things are cold. One thing that we can take advantage of is uh, the fact that materials become superconducting. So imagine the following. I couldn't find a good picture for this, and so I just need to illustrate it here. This is the uh, uh, this is the mass that was on the end of the bar. Okay. Imagine that you have near to it an inductor. On the other side, you have another inductor. You can do this with just one of them; it doesn't make any difference. Let me open a switch up up here. So imagine right now that. That this, that this line isn't there. All of this is superconducting. Let me take a wire and two wires. One coming down here. There's a break here at this point. Another wire coming down here. Let me pass a current through it. What's going to happen? Current electrons come sizzling down here, go over through this inductor over here, through this one, back out up the other wire. Okay? So what I can do is I can get a I can get a current going through this. I can get a magnetic field. Then because I have a current in this coil, I contain a magnetic field between this mass and this. Now then because things are superconducting, what I do is that I close the switch up here. Turn off my battery up above. Once I've closed the switch and all this is superconducting, then the current will just go round and round and round like that. Okay? Everyone with me so far on what we have? Now, here I have a bunch of stored energy, one half Li squared, okay? Between here and here. Now, let this be the mass on the end of the bar that begins vibrating. I've now, I've now built myself a transducer. Flux is conserved, now in this case. What happens when the mass, let's say, moves over this way? What it does is it decreases the inductance of this inductor. Okay? It decre or you can look at it another way, it pushes the flux out. Pushes the flux out of this inductor and tries to push it over here. If I get a changing flux, what do I get? Second, second semester E&M again, freshman E&M. Had a change in flux, what do you get? Faraday's law of induction also. Yeah. You have a change in flux, you get an EMF. You're going to get a voltage across this. If all of this is superconducting around here, it's going to push some current, some oscillating current, this delta I that we've got to show through, going to, going to put it through that guy. So as this guy goes back and forth, I'm going to induce a, I'm going to transduce, really to be correct, my uh, mechanical motion of this guy into, a, uh, uh, into an oscillating uh, current over here, which I will then transform and read out with a squid magnetometer. Superconducting quantum interference device, Josephson junction, call it what you will. All right, uh, a, uh, and I don't want to take any time for which Kip will be thankful uh, talking about squids. Yes, sir. Yes. Yep. Yeah.